Well, welcome back to Environmental Psychology. In the last two lectures, we emphasized the ways in which people actively change their environments to modify them in some way. So people modify their personal space or their territoriality, or they engage in wasteful or sustainable behaviors to change the quality of the environment. In today's lecture, we're going to focus on how people respond to their environments physiologically, behaviorally, psychologically. And there are at least two ways in which environments influence people's responses. On the one hand, environments provide a wide range of opportunities. So in this first slide, you see the pristine, clean air of a lakeside environment in British Columbia. And in the bottom figure, in the bottom picture, you see a contaminated environment, which is a kind of constraint because it has health implications for people that are quite detrimental if they're exposed to those toxins. Now, it turns out that most situations involve a combination of opportunities and constraints. So in this slide, we see that in downtown Manhattan, people are confronted with very high levels of density and congestion. And those represent some of the constraints that people are exposed to in a high density environment, such as New York. At the same time, residents of Manhattan have access to a very wide range of cultural, entertainment, sports, and other recreational activities. So it's a, a cultural center that affords all kinds of excellent opportunities to pursue one's goals and interests. And it turns out that people respond to environments with this mix of opportunities and constraints depending on which of those constraints and opportunities they most highly value and are most important to them. So many people will be quite willing to accept some of the environmental stressors of congestion and density if they put a higher value on some of the cultural opportunities afforded by that environment. So people weigh these costs and benefits of environmental opportunities and constraints, and that determines overall how well they adapt to the environment, how much they like that environment, and that's going to vary from individual to individual because everybody's going to have very different preferences and priorities in terms of what they want from their environment. Now I'm going to show you a, a YouTube video here from Bangkok, Thailand to give you an idea of the levels of density that some residents of Bangkok are dealing with and you can compare that to our uh, North American example of Midtown Manhattan. So that video gives you an idea of the level of density that uh, some folks in Bangkok, Thailand are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, this slide takes us back to a couple of studies that we discussed earlier in the course involving some very important opportunities and constraints for individuals in those environments. So in the upper part of that slide, you see a diagram of the residential apartments that were studied by Festinger, Schachter, and Bach at MIT. And we saw from their research that the architectural design of those residential apartments had a profound influence on residents' opportunities to form friendships and social networks with others living in that same community. And specifically, we found that individuals that lived closest together, spatial proximity, had a direct effect on their tendency to form friendships with those close neighbors. In the second diagram in that slide, we see a summary of some of the research findings from Barker and Gump's study of large and small high schools, their research on behavior settings in large and small high schools. And what they found is that for students going to very small high schools, there was a kind of pressure on them to get involved in more activities to keep those settings going. So they were on the football team, and they were on the newspaper, and they were a cheerleader, and they participated in student government. So when you have a small high school, you need more individuals doing multiple kinds of participations to keep that setting going. Whereas in a large high school, there's much less pressure on individual students to get involved in those activities. In fact, it's harder for them to get involved because the entrance requirements for example, getting into the school orchestra is much tougher when you're in a very large high school with thousands of students. So in that graph from Barker and Gump's research, we see on the left axis the participation rate of students in extracurricular activities. 
per 1,000 students in their schools. And on the bottom axis, the, the x-axis, we see nine different classes of high school sizes, ranging from the very smallest at the one on the graph to the very largest at nine on the graph, where you have thousands of students enrolled in that high school. And what we see in this graph is generally an inverse correlation between high school size and participation rates. So the larger the high school, the less likely it is for students in those schools to become widely involved in a, a variety of different extracurricular participations. So in a sense, high school size, and very large high school size, imposes some constraints on those students because it makes it more difficult for them to get involved in these different extracurricular activities and to meet other students and form friendships with them. Now, opportunities to form social networks and social ties may be a life or death matter in some situations. And we see that from this very important study published by Berkman and Syme in 1979. Berkman and Syme were interested in knowing the, the relationship between social integration, whether somebody is isolated socially or they have a lot of social ties, and their health status, and in particular, their mortality rate. So they randomly sampled 7,000 individuals from Alameda County, California. And they followed these individuals for nine years. And in the very first year, the very first part of that study, they collected a lot of data on the individuals. So one of the scales that were computed for each participant in that study was a social integration index. And you see in the top part of that slide a diagram showing an individual's potential social relationships with family, with church members, with colleagues at work, with friends. And the individuals who had a very high number of social connections or relationships were coded as the highest integration participants. And those that were most isolated, had the fewest social connections across those different domains of their life, were coded as the lowest social integration individuals. And the overall finding from this study is that individuals who are most isolated were most likely to die over the nine years that they were followed in this longitudinal prospective study. So the bottom graph there from this study shows three different age cohorts among the 7,000 or so individuals that were in this study. There were actually 6,928, but that's a very large number of, of individuals who were followed over the course of the study. So one of the cohorts on the left side are individuals aged 30 to 49. The middle cohort were individuals 50 to 59 years of age. And on the right side, you see those 60 to 69 years of age. So this is simply splitting up the sample in terms of these different age ranges. And you see that some of the differences between those who are socially isolated and socially integrated are most pronounced among the older cohort, which makes sense because those individuals are going to be more susceptible to health problems in any event. But Interestingly, when you look at the darkest columns there, the dark blue columns and the light blue columns for men and women, those are the most isolated, least integrated individuals. And what we find is that, or what Berkman and Syme found, is that for women, the most isolated, least integrated individuals were 2.8 times more likely to die over the course of that study, the nine year follow-up period, than those that had the highest number of social ties. And similarly for the males participating in that study, those who were least integrated, had the fewest social ties, were 2.3 times more likely to die than those that had the most social ties. So we see a very profound impact on being involved in social relationships and the tendency to die prematurely over the nine-year follow-up period in this study. Now importantly, the researchers controlled for a number of potentially confounding variables. So at the very early time point in the study, they measured individuals' perceptions of their health status. They asked them about their health practices, whether they consume alcohol or smoke, or whether they're regularly physically active. Uh, they coded each individual for their socioeconomic status. And of course, they measured their levels of social integration on the integration scale. And controlling for most of those factors, social integration still had a very significant impact on people's mortality rates over the course of that study. So controlling for their health practices, controlling for their socioeconomic status, 
controlling for their subjective appraisals of their health and their actual physical health status. None of those, none of those factors negated the significant influence of social integration and its relationship to health. So the individuals most isolated were most likely to die in that study. It's a very important study. It's very well controlled. Moreover, that study has been replicated in many uh, subsequent studies. So it's a, it's a pretty stable finding. On the other hand, we still don't know the, the mechanisms or the pathways that lead from a social tie, a social relationship, and a physiological health situation, how, that, how social ties get under our skin or into our bodies. Is it because that individuals uh, get valuable health information from their friends that they're related to or from family members? Is it because being involved in close relationships makes people feel better, more accepted, more worthy, and those positive emotions uh, help to buffer negative stress reactions in the body? Is it the health practices that people model from others that they're related to. So we know from the uh, study by Christakis and Fowler that we talked about earlier in the course that in social networks where individuals that one is connected to start to get heavier, physically heavier, they're more likely to become overweight themselves. So there are a number of ways in which social networks can affect our physical health or our tendency to develop a disease. But the striking and important finding from this study is that social integration had a very positive effect in protecting people from premature mortality, whereas social isolation uh, was a risk factor and more predictive of early mortality. Now, the next slide raises the question whether virtual social networks have the same protective value for health as place-based networks. We know that today, unlike in 1979, when Berkman and Syme did their study, people are deriving social connections and friendships much more online than ever previously. And so a question arises, does support from a Facebook friend, if one has 600 or 700 or 1,000 Facebook friends, does that convey the same protective value for one's health as an individual that a person's engaged in on a day-to-day -day basis, face-to-face, -face, in a place-based environment? And that's an open question. We don't know the answer to that question at this point. So in this particular slide, we see the pictures of a particular individual's friendships, number of friends on, on Facebook. And to the right, the right portion of that slide, we see a, a wide variety of social networking sites on the internet. So this is the, the virtual opportunities provided for friendship is becoming a very important factor in people's lives. But we don't know how those kinds of friendships compare to more traditional place-based friendships and social networks in influencing people's health. Now, this next slide indicates a variety of different stressors that impose constraints on individuals in their day-to-day -day lives. And in this lecture, we're going to look at the evidence relating to each of these kinds of stressors. So ambient temperature, for example, has been studied in relation to people's tendencies toward violence and crime. And we'll talk about some studies of that. Residential relocation, we know, is a very stressful, disruptive kind of experience that people go through. And that sometimes has implications for their psychological well-being and even their physical well-being. Conditions of poverty are particularly detrimental because they engage a wide range of stressors that people are exposed to, from dilapidated housing, poorer schools, broken families, worries about community crime. So it's a multi-stressor condition, poverty. And that's another factor that has dramatic influences on people's well-being. Chronic noise exposure. We know that chronic noise can increase people's physiological arousal from heart rate to blood pressure. And particularly, uncontrollable and unpredictable noise has very detrimental effects on people's task performance and other psychological indicators. Urban density and traffic congestion, very important class of stressors that uh, there's been a lot of research on those looking at the kinds of health implications of living in chronically, high dense, chronically dense environments. The health implications of living in environments that are extremely high density, just like the one we saw in Bangkok or in midtown Manhattan. Stimulation overload, we read Milgram's paper 
on urban dwellers' efforts to try to cope with the onslaught of all the information and, and stimulation that they're exposed to in midtown Manhattan. And finally, natural and technological disasters. These are a very important class of stressors, and they're a very powerful class of stressors that people are exposed to because they have such tremendous disruptive power in their lives. Whether we're talking about a hurricane or a tsunami or an earthquake, we know the widespread devastation and destruction that those kinds of stressors can impose and the kinds of constraints they place on people's lives. So these are some of the types of stressors that we'll be talking about today as they impose various kinds of constraints on individuals. In this slide, we see some graphs from earlier research on ambient temperature in cities and residents' propensity to engage in murder, rape, uh, and aggressive crime. So the first graph on the top of that slide shows the murder and rapes per day in relation to temperature or heat. So as heat goes up, the levels of urban crime in terms of murders and rapes per day goes up. It's almost a, a it's a generally linear trend, even though there's a dip there uh, at temperature 86 through 91, it's still by and large a linear trend showing a positive correlation between heat and those forms of violence. And in the graph below, the aggressive crime ratio refers to those crimes that involve violence toward another person as opposed to crimes such as burglary, which don't necessarily involve uh, violence per se, physical violence or white collar crime. But for aggressive crimes, we see that same relationship that the higher the temperature, the more the heat goes up, the greater the propensity for people to engage in aggressive crime. So these are very interesting findings. We, we often take ambient temperature of our surroundings for granted. Sure, it can be a discomfort, it can be a hassle, but until these studies were done, we didn't realize that it actually correlates to some extent with crime rates, violence rates, and urban conditions, the conditions that people are living in and their, their overall well-being. So very important studies of temperature. An important framework for understanding the effects of stressors on individuals was developed by a medical researcher at McGill University in Montreal, Canada, named Hans Selye. And during his work as a medical student at McGill, he noticed that across many different patients, whether they were suffering from cancer or a gunshot wound or extreme variations in temperature, uh, they all came in with a certain set of common symptoms that he began to refer to as the general adaptation syndrome. And by the general adaptation syndrome, he meant that these different types of diseases and uh, injury conditions that people were dealing with all were characterized by a common set of symptoms that went above and beyond the specific symptoms of a given disease. Some of these symptoms included a, a higher rate of ulcers, stomach ulcers, swollen adrenal glands, indicating that adrenaline secretion was higher in those individuals, which is part of the fight-flight response in organisms. Also, shrinkage of the thymus gland, indicating some compromise of the individual's immune system. So these were all symptoms included in this general adaptation syndrome that Selye observed as a medical student and then began to publish his work when he graduated from medical school. And his book, The Stress of Life, is one of the most important milestone publications on the conceptualization of stress as it affects people's physical health. Selye defined stress very much in biomedical or physiological terms. So his definition of stress or physiological stress is the nonspecific response of the body to environmental demands that exceed the body's capacity to cope with those demands. So when an individual is in a situation where they're overwhelmed with too many physical demands or disease constraints on their body, they go into a potential stress response which has these physiological symptoms that I referred to. Now, later conceptualizations of stress, such as those formulated by Richard Lazarus and his colleagues at the University of California, Berkeley, place much greater emphasis on people's perception of demands and their perceptions of their own capacity to cope with those demands. 
So rather than there being an absolute value of physical demands that affect individuals in a uniform way, the people's responses, individuals' responses to these stressors vary depending on their particular appraisal of the situation. So uh, we'll, we'll talk some more about Lazarus's conception of psychological stress. But in Selye's instance, in Selye's model, stress is very much conceptualized as a biomedical or physiological issue. Now, in this slide, we see a representation of his general adaptation syndrome in terms of three different phases. The first phase being the alarm stage, where someone is confronted with extreme demands. And often in that phase, they rise to the occasion. Their body is able to adapt. Uh, they're able to cope with that stressor for a period of time. And so this is referred to as the stage of resistance, the middle stage. But if they're chronically exposed to very extreme stressors for too long, they begin to go into the stage of exhaustion, where their body begins to get fatigued and their coping capacity begins to give out. And that's where people become particularly prone to disease problems, to premature mortality, as was found in the Berkman and Syme study. So it's important to know that in Selye's model, there are, there, it's a very temporal or phasic kind of model where initially people are able to cope and deal with those stressors fairly well, but if they persist too long, then they start to show this stage of exhaustion. And when we talk about poverty being a multi-stressor kind of situation for people, where in poverty situations, they're locked into chronic exposure to fear of community violence, to broken families, to low income and all the problems that presents to families. In those kinds of uh, chronic and long-term situations, people are particularly likely to experience the stage of exhaustion. They, they begin to give up. It's, it's harder to keep coping because there are so many aspects of their surroundings that seem to be stacked against them. So we've mentioned these, these physiological symptoms of the general adaptation syndrome. We said they're, they're nonspecific. They're general to a lot of different diseases. So it's not like you can diagnose a, you know, a particular disease with a set of symptoms. These are, are symptoms that cut across many different kinds of diseases that stress us. Direct pathogens are those things that we encounter in terms of stressors or microbes that have an impact, a negative impact on our bodies sort of immediately and directly. So they're sort of deterministic. The germ th theory was like that. It said when we get exposed to germs, the body goes into a kind of host reaction to that and often is overcome and isn't able to resist the disease. You get sick. And we saw that there are other things that enter in, like psychological stress or psychological sense of coherence that protect people from getting sick. And we saw that in Sheldon Cohen's study of uh, people's susceptibility to colds as a function of their general stress levels in their lives. An indirect pathogen causes damage because they provoke exaggerated defensive responses. So when we're worrying about something or we're feeling out of sorts because something traumatic or acute has happened to us, that kind of stress that goes on for a while creates inflammation in the body. And we know that even though Selye didn't study things like inflammation processes in the blood vessels or cortisol and other uh, kind of hormones that get uh, secreted by the body under stress, those are similar kind of physiological responses to prolonged stress along with ulcers, adrenal gland uh, enlargement, and thymus shrinkage. So these are some of those kind of indirect pathogens uh, that can lead to these very major disease states here, cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. If somebody is smoking uh, in a chronic way or physically inactive or eating badly or they have obesity, which puts, puts extra metabolic load on their bodies and causes inflammation due to chronic stress, that's a kind of indirect pathogen. It's indirect because you may be stressed about a relationship or you may be stressed about losing a loved one, but that stress is what's causing the inflammation and indirectly over time, that's having a negative impact on you, not just the immediate event that created the stress in the first place. So it's important when people are going through stress to try to turn that off to the extent possible as soon as possible so it's, it doesn't become chronic and uh, more insidious over time. Now, some of the stressors I'm going to talk about involve a heavy component, a large component of 
psychological appraisal. Should I be worried about this stressor or not? Is it of consequence or not? So we get to Lazarus's notion of psychological stress, and it's very much about the perception of a, of a demand or a stressor being threatening to you. And if you don't see it that way, then you're not going to have those negative physiological symptoms that Selye talked about. So it's not just the objective reality out there, it's how you're perceiving it. And when we talked about Sal Matty's uh, hardiness training article, what he was trying to do there through hardiness training was to promote what he called transformational coping. Transformational coping is to take a negative life event and reframe it in a way that it becomes more doable or solvable. So you're not stuck with something you can't uh, rise to and resolve, but rather it's something you reframe in your mind and you transform it so that you become an active coper. And that has to do with your perceived capacity to react to and cope with those demands that previously you felt were uh, just overwhelming. Now, Lazarus's model of stress appraisal involves these different processes. Primary appraisal is where we consider if a situation poses a threat, a challenge, or a harm, or loss. And you know, the determining factors of that are, are features of the immediate situation, your psychological makeup, your personality, your sense of confidence or efficacy. The secondary process is evaluating your resources to cope with that demand. So this is the demand itself. Is it a big or worrisome demand or not? This one is, do you have the wherewithal to deal with it and cope with it effectively? So that's the secondary process. And that has to do with your perceived availability of resources, either from within yourself or the environment. And that's where social networks can be really helpful because they can provide you with the support to get through something tough or they can provide you with monetary resources to buffer the effects of a bad time. And then you reappraise the situation all over again to see if it's getting better, getting worse, and whether there's been a marked change in the situation or in you, in your coping capacity. If you've gone through hardiness training, maybe you've become more of a transformational coper and you're able to deal with that situation better. <coughs> now we said that we were gonna look at some different kinds of stressors and demands on people. Moving residents can be a hassle, right? You have to box things up. You have to say goodbye to good friends in one environment, try to make new friends in a new environment. So even under the best of circumstances, it can be demanding and stressful and a kind of a constraint. And in fact, in the stressful life event scale, it's one of those events that gets fairly high points because whether you, you wanna go somewhere that you're looking forward to moving to or you're moving to some place that you are sorry about it, it's still a hassle. Now, what we have here is this different process that people go through from birth to death where they have different life stages. So here's a person who, as an adult, is in a life stage where they have a job, they have a home, an apartment, they have their social recreational activities and settings in their community, and they have this commute between home and work. And they can look back over their life and, and decide, are they, have they gotten better? Have they improved their lot or not? But this anticipation thing is looking toward a move, a relocation, where they're gonna lose their home, go into a smaller apartment, and get rid of their job, and get rid of their commute, which they may be happy about. So they have their apartment and some social relations. They're looking toward that. And a lot of elderly people are faced with being relo relocated to an institutional facility where they're scaling down. They're not gonna have all of this and they're gonna to have to live in a more controlled situation that uh, can be very difficult for them. And there's been some interesting re research on cognitive mapping with elderly that shows that if you can give them a positive image and a schema for their new environment where they get to know what it is, they're not so surprised when they get there, it highlights some of the positive features of that new environment. When they make that transition, they're less likely to suffer disease or death because elderly can be pretty frail when they're going into institutionalized settings. So the way we frame these life changes, relocation, has a lot to do with just how stressful that life event's gonna be. Now, if this person is choosing to retire and downsize and looking forward to playing more golf or whatever they like to do in their spare time, get rid of a uh, you know, nasty commute, they may be very happy about that change. But if somebody got laid off of work because of bad economy, and they're looking at being forced into much smaller quarters, and they've lost their job, and they're feeling pretty crummy about that, 
then that's a much more stressful relocation event. So in terms of Lazarus's appraisal process, we can look at a relocation in very different ways depending on how people are framing it. Now you'd think that most people, if they're moving into better circumstances, like moving from a slum to more modern housing, they'd be happy about that, they'd be better off. But what Mark Fried, a sociologist at Boston University found, is that people go through the, a grief syndrome, and these are people that he studied here were people living in poverty environments, and because of urban renewal strategies, they were forced to move to a quote, nicer building. So their neighborhood was getting bulldozed, and I showed you some examples in Beijing where sort of uh, old style courtyard neighborhoods are being bulldozed so that people can put up these, the, the government and developers can put up these high rise residential complexes. But what happened to these people that went from the poverty environment to a so called nicer building is they were extremely stressed and they went through what Fried called a grief syndrome. Uh, symptoms of depression, uh, physiological stress like Selye talks about that often occur after individuals are involuntarily pushed out of their existing environment from a highly valued residential environment like their neighborhood, even though it was low income, they had their friends there, they had their contacts and supports, now they're being pushed to an unfamiliar area and that can create some very uh, serious stress for people. So even if it looks like objectively they're going to something better, it doesn't always play out that way psychologically. We said earlier that stressors have cumulative additive effects. So if people are living in poverty, and poverty is one of those lifestyle circumstances that involves a lot of uh, multiple stressors from poor housing to crowded schools to neighborhood <coughs> violence worries, broken families, <coughs> low income. So all of these things together are contributing to the stress environment of poverty. So these effects of stressors can be quite additive and cumulative, and that makes those stressors more chronic it makes them harder to deal with, and that's where people go into this stage of exhaustion. They give up, they don't see any way out, uh, they lose hope. Now losing hope, how many of you have heard the term learned helplessness? You've probably heard this, some of the, your PSB majors have heard this in other classes. And it refers to a kind of syndrome, both cognitive, emo, uh, motivational, and emotional, which comes about because of uh, recurring encounters with uncontrollable events. The more you get exposed to uncontrollable events, the more you begin to believe that you can't do anything. The world is stacked against you and everything is under somebody else's control, not your own internal control. Now the research on this comes from um, Marty Seligman's work with dogs actually, where he had some of the dogs caged up and uh, some of the dogs were shocked. These dogs here were shocked repeatedly whenever they tried to uh, get out of that. And they were harnessed so that they couldn't get over this uh, barrier to the non-electrified area. And so they went through that shock training where they were harnessed and prevented from getting to a better place. And then they put them in a, a second phase uh, where you had dogs that were not shocked initially and restrained and those that were and you can see that even when those dogs could were not restrained and they could jump over that barrier the ones that went through the helplessness training were much more likely to do that behavior they just cowered in that part of the cage uh, when the shock went on question internal locus of control is a personality trait defined as an individual seeing the events in their life as being under the control of either themselves internally or external events. So it's a personality disposition. Learned helplessness is a more chronic kind of developmental thing that, the, that happens where you're, re, you're exposed to repeated uncontrollable events and you begin to give up. Now you can have external people who, and, and they're gradations, it's not completely dichotomous, you're either an internal or external. Some people can be sort of high externals. They have some belief that they could do something to improve their situation. And some people might be low internal. They have some sense of efficacy, but they're not that confident. Helplessness implies the kind of extreme end where you're an external and you've kind of given up. So it's a good question. Uh, motivational syndrome, learned helplessness versus a personality trait, internal, external control.
Yes. It's a kind of, yeah, Catherine's mentioning that this could be seen as a kind of conditioning paradigm where the animals are being conditioned to give up because they're restrained, they're shocked, they can't do anything about it. And that's, a, yeah, that's a good point, a parallel. So is everybody clear about learned helplessness and what that is? And we want to talk about how some environmental stressors can lead to learned helplessness. Poverty certainly is a good candidate for that. Let's talk about noise. We said noise is one of those stressors we're going to look at. And a lot of you deal with loud noise or loud music, depending on how you want to define it. And everybody's perception or appraisal of music is different. So some people you know, regard one type of music as noise, others don't. But noise is, is, def is essentially unwanted sound. And you can measure it in terms of its loudness and decibels, its predictability, do we know when it's going to happen or not, and whether it's controllable. Can you turn it off? So if you live across the street of the campus and the drummers get going in a parking structure and you're trying to go to sleep, you know, it's pretty uncontrollable noise. And it's probably unpredictable because they may take a little break from their practice and then, then they kick in again and you don't know when it's going to happen. And that, those qualities here, these psychological qualities of noise are as detrimental to people or more so than the loudness of noise. So we want to take a look at, at some examples of that. So Glass and Singer did this really interesting set of experiments in laboratory settings on people's reactions to noise. And they exposed people to about 30 minutes of a melange of different sounds played very loudly. And while they were playing the sound, they measured uh, certain physiological stress indicators such as skin conductance or, or how much your, uh, the surface of your skin might be perspiring and that conducts electricity better. It's a measure of, of arousal. Um, people could, in some cases, escape the noise. They, could push a, they were told they could push a panic button and turn it off if they didn't like it. In another case, they were told nothing about a panic button. They had to sit there and take it. The data analyses, of course, excluded anybody that pushed the panic button in the control, the high control condition. So they only wanted to see people that perceived they had the control, but they didn't feel they had to use it, versus the people that didn't perceive they had control. They also varied the predictability of the noise. So it would come in very even bursts, boom, 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 or it would come very erratically, boom, ba ba boom, you know, that kind of thing. And they wanted to see whether those psychological qualities of the noise, the predictability and the controllability, had equal or greater impacts on people's behavior than the loudness of the noise. And the way they measured this, interestingly, was not so much in the experimental situation where they're getting exposed to the noise for the thir first 30 minutes, but after noise exposure when they went to a quiet room. Because Glass and Singer reasoned that often stressors have after effects. We can rise to the occasion and deal with them while we're in the midst of the situation. So you can get through that rush hour traffic, but you might come home and be really angry at you know, the first person you say hello to when you get out of that car because it's having that kind of after effect on you. So they were interested in these delayed effects of stressors. Now these are some data from their experiment which show people's responses. And here they're doing a proofreading task after noise exposure. And you've got people that are being exposed to unpredictable loud or soft noise. And this is the percentage of proofreading errors they made. And you can see they're kind of close up there between the loud and soft. Here you've got loud predictable noise, fewer errors, and soft predictable noise. And then a control group that had no noise. So you know, this is suggesting that even when you've got uh, loud predictable noise, the negative effects in terms of poor performance are greater in the soft decibel condition where it's unpredictable. So the predictability is getting in the way here even when you're exposing people to softer noise. It's still disruptive because of its unpredictability. Here you've got the condition where they're told they have the panic button, they can push it if they want to turn the noise off in the laboratory, or they, they're not told that, they have no perceived control. And here you have the percentage of errors again. And then they take them into the quiet room afterward and they say, okay, here, do some tasks. And the people with no perceived control are, are making much more, many more errors here than the people with the perceived control. So this perception of control turns out to be a really uh, critical issue for people. These are the skin conductance scores I told you about in uh, different, there we go, uh, 
in the loud, unpredictable, soft noise, loud, predictable, soft noise control condition. And what you see is that people, even in the loud, unpredictable condition, can, can adjust or adapt over time. These are the different phases of that 30-minute exposure to noise. So in all cases, they are adapting. Even though the loud noise creates a spike at the beginning, they all sort of come down in that physiological arousal. And physiology is where Cellier was looking for stress indicators. So this is during the, the uh, successive blocks of noise, and you can see that pattern of, of physiological adaptation. And what we know about uh, stress is that the indicators can work differently. So you can have skin conductance going down, but if somebody is in a distress situation where they're worried about something or afraid they can't cope, you get not only a burst of adrenaline, but you also get what's called cortisol. It's an indicator in the blood of stress response. Here, when somebody's working on something they really like and they're, they're geared up for it, they're enjoying it, but they don't have distress, you don't have that cortisol. In fact, you have a lower cortisol reading. And here, when people are distressed, they're not working on anything, but they may be sitting around uh, worrying about something, you've got the adrenaline and the cortisol again. So the profiles, the physiological profiles, of how people respond to stressors really varies depending on the, the nature of the, of, the, of the situation. So we, we talked about these after effects, these delayed effects, and, and you see that in Glass and Singer's study because what's happening there is people are taken out of the noisy room into the quiet room, and that's where you're seeing these decrements in performance on proofreading. They also gave them soluble and insoluble puzzles, and that was an interesting uh, task as well, and I'll say a little bit more about, about those. So we're going to talk about rush hour and traffic congestion. And here you've got a situation, uh, this is Beijing, by the way, on one of the ring roads, and this is the 405 in Irvine. And uh, how does traffic congestion affect us? And it turns out it affects some people pretty badly, uh, particularly if they feel that they're constrained to live far away from work and they have to make that long commute even though they don't want to versus a family that decided to live far away from the job because they like the neighborhood, the schools are good, the kids are happy there, safe environment. So the person's willing to make that long commute. They're not as stressed by it. So to try to take a look at how traffic congestion affects people, Professor Navaco and I, raised in PSB, uh, when we were young assistant professors, we decided to do a study of commuting patterns among Southern Californians coming to Irvine to either Allegan Corporation or Fleur Corporation. And some of them were uh, commuting 20 to 30 minutes, several miles away. Others were commuting maybe five to six minutes. And we were interested in how does that exposure to traffic congestion uh, really affects uh, people's experience and their stress. So this is Ray and me back in the day uh, with our blood pressure monitor here. And the employee would drive into the parking lot at one of those companies and we would put their arm in the the uh, cuff and we would get their blood pressure. We would then go into, later in the day, we'd go into the conference room at work and have those individuals fill out uh, various uh, surveys and do various tasks. If you look at their commuting condition or situation in terms of its objective features, like they're driving 20 miles, 30 minutes on average versus a shorter commute, and how they perceive their commute subjectively, we had some people pretty satisfied with their commute. They'd say, I'm highly in job, uh, involved in my job. I like the people I work with and other aspects of my work environment. Uh, about their home, they'd say, I chose to live there because I like the neighborhood. The home is well suited to my needs. Well, this subjective appraisal, a la Lazarus, uh, made all the difference because the people commuting the same amount of distance and time had very different experiences depending on whether they were sort of resentful and fighting that commute versus, okay, I chose to do this. Uh, while I'm commuting, I'll listen to a tape or I'll shave or something like that. Nowadays, people will uh, have a lot of ways of staying in touch and calling ahead with their cell phone. If they're gonna be late, there's less stress because of that because you can use these technologies to let people at the other end know that you're, you're coming in a little bit later. One of the reasons we have this ecological contextual approach to environmental psychology is the factors that are in the broader situation, like the fact that we now have cell phones and we have job sharing and people can telecommute from their home to work and there are norms that sort of make that doable now. They don't have to put up with that rush hour traffic as much. So if we repeated this study today 
the societal context is so different, I'm not sure we would find the same kind of relationships between uh, traffic distance and time and the increased physiological stress, especially among people who had low control. They had low control of where they lived, where they worked, and that's the, the group that showed the most stress in our study. But as they have these other technologies to fall back on, uh, maybe we wouldn't replicate those same findings today. And by the same token, we said that in the Festinger, Schachter, and Bach studies at MIT, where they looked at the effects of residential proximity on friendship formation, when they you know, went to a different context, the suburbs of Boston, instead of married graduate students at MIT, where the neighborhood was more diverse, more affluent, people were more mobile, they didn't see those direct effects of the deterministic effects of proximity on friendship formation. So the context that, that's surrounding the variables we're most interested in is really important. And that's what we mean by contextual analysis or ecological analysis, looking at the broader picture because there's layers of influence on how those variables work together. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the Los Angeles Noise Project study that Shell Cohen, uh, Gary Evans, Dave Krantz, and I did uh, back in the 80s. And we've seen this slide before when we talked about environmental injustice, the fact that these schools are all in minority neighborhoods in LA. But I want to talk about it today in terms of our studies of stress among the children going to those schools. So we set up the study where we had these four elementary schools in the flight path of the airport. And they were in the Inglewood area and uh, pretty low income uh, racial minority. And then we had control schools that were in quieter zones matched for similar socioeconomic status and racial composition of the schools. And so that was our, our basic design. We had these four uh, treatment schools in the noise zone, and then we had some schools in San Pedro and other areas that were matched for socioeconomic uh, status, uh, but they weren't noisy. We also had a, a before and after phase where we measured uh, kids in the spring, and then the airport with some funding that they gave to the schools, uh, the schools were able to do sound insulation on the schools to see if that sound abatement helped the kids in the fall. So when we went back and measured the children's stress levels in the fall, did they change as a function of that architectural modification in their schools? All right, so this is what the planes look like from the vantage point of the children going to these noisy schools in the flight path. And this is more of a, a kind of map at the area where we were in the Inglewood and Lenox school districts for these uh, main target schools in the noise zone. And we were primarily interested in this relationship. The hypothesis was, does high blood pressure, or the key research question, does higher exposure to school noise increase blood pressure at school when we measured their blood pressures at school? Did it also affect their academic performance and performance on various tasks? We also did some analyses where we measured the children's uh, residential location. Were, was it in the noise contours of LA airport or outside of the noise contours? Because we were interested in the additive effects of school noise exposure and home noise exposure on the blood pressure readings we're getting at school, as well as on their stress levels at home. So both of these behavior settings can contribute to those measures. So this is sort of expanding our analysis spatially or ecologically to see whether the home noise and the school noise has an additive effect, like Gary Evans talks about in his, his paper on poverty. These data sh suggest that the noise and quiet schools that we uh, chose for our sample were, were not significantly different. You see this not significant here on family size, on father's education and mother's education. So no differences, which was good because we wanted to kind of try to boil down the effects to the effects of noise. Now we didn't do a, random, a randomized controlled experiment obviously because you can't assign people to live in a noisy zone or in a quiet zone. So we had to do what's called a quasi-experimental design where you control for these important variables statistically, you try to match your schools as best you can, then you focus on the variable of interest, namely noise level. So we looked at blood pressures and these are third and fourth graders and what we saw is that uh, here you've got physiological differences are more pronounced among the children that were in the schools less years. And for the children that were in the school more years, there's less difference, but you still see that the noisy school kids have higher systolic blood pressures and higher 
diastolic blood pressures. And these are not in the hypertensive range, but the question is, if students are going to school in these environments chronically for several years, does that predispose them to hypertension later on? And that's an issue that's come up in a lot of subsequent cases where uh, airport proposals have been floated, like in Orange County where it was shot down actually and it didn't go through. Is that because we have a more affluent community here that could push back or is it because there was more data showing what the negative effects of noise are on people? In any event, these were some of the data we found. Uh, we had, for other measures, we, we had the children come into a sound insulated trailer where they couldn't hear the airplanes going over their school. So it was a very insulated environment. And we tested five of them at a time. They did these tasks. Here they had to pick out shapes that we showed them from a list of cards. They did proofreading, scaled for third and fourth grade level. They did soluble and insoluble puzzles. So we, we mirrored a lot of what Glass and Singer did in the laboratory studies, but we were doing it out in the field in this quasi-experimental uh, paradigm. Here we found that uh, when you give children a soluble puzzle, something they can actually solve, and I'll show you some examples of what those are, uh, the noisy school children, especially those that have been exposed to that noise for more years in the school, are, take much longer, many more seconds, to solve that puzzle than the kids in the quiet school. And it, that's not exactly the case here, obviously, but as you see the time elapsing here, there's more of a difference between those groups. So looking between Glass and Singer's lab studies and our field study, we saw some interesting parallels that you have after effects of noise exposure, whether it's in the laboratory or in the field to airplane noise, on children's propensity to make errors on tasks, give up on puzzles that they could solve. Uh, this is one other data or result we had on proofreading, where we gave the children uh, proofreading tasks. And you can see here, although the, the quiet children are not as effective on that task for the people that haven't been in the school as long. As you get out here among those that have been in the school for four or more years, uh, the quiet school children have a, a marked advantage in terms of their uh, ability to detect errors, proofreading errors, and pick out ease. But, uh, can you go back to that slide for a minute? Yeah, I just want to clarify, the, the, it, wasn't, it wasn't so much proofreading errors, it was like could they find the E's in all the words on the page. So what we were asking them to do was uh, every time they saw an E to cross it out. So this, this is measuring the percentage of E's that they were able to find and locate as they did that task. So it wasn't quite the same task as Glass and Singer were doing with the ad adults, but it was similar. Now just as we saw these after effects of noise in children, uh, this is a study by Marianne Frankenhäuser in Sweden where she was looking at the adrenaline secretion rates for workers undergoing a period of overtime work. And these are the weeks here where they were working extra hours, up to 15 extra hours a week. And you can see that peaking here around week seven or eight. And she took urinary uh, samples and analyzed them for adrenaline levels both during the daytime hours at work and then at home at night. She, she followed them back home and in the evening hours uh, had them provide these samples. And what she found is you can see this delayed spiking of adrenaline secretion at home. Once people are out of the sort of work environment itself, these effects are cumulative. They stay with them as they go home. So that was a kind of interesting uh, demonstration that you can see these increases even in the, the supposedly non-stress environment uh, after they get home from a, a place where they're putting in extra time. So it's another indication of these physiological after effects of stress. All right, we're going to give you a, a short break and then we're going to come back and finish up. So take a relax a little bit and we'll be back with you. Yeah. So we've been talking about different processes that can create these after effects when people are exposed to constraints and demands. We talked about learned helplessness, which is a motivational kind of giving up, right? Because you get overwhelmed, you just don't believe you can do anything anymore, so you give up. Now I'm gonna talk about something which is a little different kind of process called attentional overload. When our attentional capacity is so taxed by having to process too much information, that we start to get irritable, we start to make mistakes, we just can't track everything 
because there's too much coming at us. And I think a lot of us can relate to that these days when we're getting communications from so many different devices and channels and so many emails each day. You know, how do you sort of digest all that and keep it all organized? So we're going to talk about this, this overload issue. And it comes up a lot in the Matthews and Cannon study of the lawnmower and helping somebody who has a cast on their arm. How many of you read that article, the, the Matthews and Cannon? You got, I, I want more arms going up. It's really important. No, it's a really, yeah. So is it, what, what's your name again? Kehal. yeah. So Kehal, um, well, I won't ask you to, to recount the whole article, but I'm glad that you read it. And uh, I want you all to really pay attention to that one. It's an important one, and it's an interesting one, and I'll show you why. But these are some societal examples where when we had the Challenger shuttle disaster and also the Columbia disaster, a lot of the people at NASA went back and they examined the decision-making process uh, when the Columbia went up and there was this problem with the heat shield and some of the uh, surface of the rocket had been knocked off. And they made the decision not to try to repair that in space. And some people at NASA said, well, partly, that, maybe that was due to people being overloaded, too much information coming too quickly. Maybe they got into kind of habitual routines of, of decision making. But sometimes these situations might be attributable to overload. Uh, when you have medical errors, and this is a book about, put out by the Institute of Medicine, which documents a lot of errors that happen in hospitals where the wrong organ is taken out or the wrong limb is removed. And you know, people know the high stress kind of environment that a hospital is where people are working overtime, a lot of residents are on, you know, without a lot of sleep there. And so this issue of attentional fatigue comes up in many different settings. It's been a factor that may contribute to errors among physicians, nurses, air traffic controllers, uh, drivers. You know, if we're texting and we're trying to pay attention to our texting and we miss something on the road and boom, we're in an accident. Irritability and aggressiveness, reduced sensitivity to social cues, which is the topic that the Matthews and Cannon study addressed. How is it that attentional overload affects our responsiveness to social cues? So let's take a look at that study. Okay, so what do you see there? Even if you haven't read the article, we're kind of boiling it down with the, the, this slide. What's going on there? You've got a, a person wearing a cast, you've got someone not wearing a cast, and the scenario is this. The experimenter has people working as part of the study. They get out of a car in a residential neighborhood, and as they're getting to the sidewalk, moving toward the front door of a house, at the sidewalk, they're carrying all these books and they drop the books all over the sidewalk. And this happens just at the time that someone is walking down the sidewalk, you know, the unsuspecting subject in the study, and they're confronted with somebody having this pratfall where they have books all over the ground and they have to make a decision. Do I stop and help them pick it up or not? So that's the, the paradigm. Now what's the other interesting thing going on, KO, in that situation? You remember in terms of the noise source? Right, so KO's pointing out that on the lawn of the home where the person's gonna be walking up to the front door, somebody's operating a lawnmower and the lawnmower is either on or it's off and when it's on, it's putting out really high noxious sound that maybe somebody wants to get away from or maybe it's distracting them from certain key cues. Now the, the critical issue in this study is whether people stop and help the person that dropped the books. And you'd think that if somebody's wearing a cast because of the norm of social responsibility, you know, we talked about norms in an earlier lecture, how that affects people's responsiveness to sustainable behavior. Well, in this case, the wearing of a cast was supposed to activate the norm of social responsibility. You help someone who's in need, they're disabled. Whereas when someone isn't wearing the cast, that norm isn't as salient. And so what they found is in the loud condition where the lawnmower is going on and it's really loud, there was no difference in people stopping. There was a very low percentage of people helping out in the, in the loud uh, lawnmower condition. But in the soft condition, you see this distinction here, this, this gap between people stopping to help someone with a cast and people stopping to help someone without a cast. So you can see in the soft condition, soft noise condition, where there's no lawnmower getting in the way, that people pay attention to the social cue, the norm of social responsibility 
does get activated and they help. And if somebody isn't wearing a cast, well, too bad, they, they don't get helped as much. But in the loud noise condition, that difference is totally wiped out. So it's almost as if the noise is impinging so much on people's awareness and their, their attention, or maybe it's creating some feelings of irritation. They want to get away from that situation. Uh, they don't help in either case. So it's an example of what we were saying in the previous slide that often stressors can reduce our sensitivity to social cues. And this is just another plotting of those data where you have passerbys who stopped, the percentage who stopped and helped, and in the low noise condition, uh, you see it's much greater for someone who's wearing a cast than the person who wasn't wearing the cast, whereas in the, the high noise condition, it doesn't matter whether you're wearing a cast or not. So it's a pretty interesting study showing some of these phenomena that we're talking about. And it relates to uh, what is called attentional overload theory. And it stipulates that people have limited attentional capacity. Each of us has just about so much we can attend to at any given time. And if we go over that limit, we can't drive and text and you know, shave at the same time. And sometimes people try to do all that multitasking, but it doesn't work very well. So information overload occurs any time the demand for attention exceeds the available capacity. Cognitive fatigue uh, is, a, is the hypothesis that if the available capacity is not fixed, but in fact it shrinks when there are prolonged demands on attention. So uh, too much attentional overload reduces our capacity to do anything else. So you can attend to fewer inputs after prolonged demands than in a rested state. And you get fatigued. Over time you get this cumulative inability to process because you're tired, mentally tired. So it's a function of task load and task duration. And remember Stanley Milgram in one of the first articles we read talked about the New Yorkers' experience of overload living in Manhattan, how they're exposed to so much stimulation. They have to tune that out or modulate it, otherwise they're going to be overwhelmed and not able to function there. The presence of an environmental stressor like a, lawn, a loud lawnmower because it requires attention, is likely to create overload. The amount of attention required to monitor an environmental stimulus is an increasing function of uncertainty that it arouses concerning its significance to us. So if we're worried about something that could be a danger to us and threaten us, we have to devote more attention to it. We can't just kind of treat it as inconsequential and ignore it. The most usual strategy uh, that people use to deal with overload is focusing available attention on aspects of the environment that are most relevant to task performance at the cost of less relevant inputs. So, you know, if your main task is texting and your secondary task is driving, that's going to cause some problems. So how people sort of prioritize what their most important task is is really pretty crucial. But we looked at these uh, attentional overload hypotheses in our noise study, and there have been a number of other studies in the environment behavior field that have replicated uh, the kinds of findings that are suggested by these hypotheses. This looks complicated, but it's a simple idea. It's called the yerkes dotson curve, and it shows the relationship between the quality of somebody's performance or the uh, quality of their health from low to high as being a function of stimulation level. So if you're low, if you're under aroused, you have low stimulation, you have poorest performance and poorest health. So your illness is higher here. Here the illness is less, your health is better. When you have moderate uh, intermediate kind of levels of arousal, you are stimulated, you perform well, but if you get overstimulated, your performance and your health start to go down. You have more illness here and poorer performance. So this is just tracking illness and performance on these two different y-axes and the uh, x-axis here is levels of arousal. So you can see it's a curvilinear function, performance, health, and arousal levels. That's called the, the yerkes dotson curve. And not surprisingly, this works differently for simple and complex tasks. So if you look at the yerkes dotson curve for, in this case, simple tasks up here, people have a higher tolerance for arousal. Their performance is better, and their arousal doesn't start to decline until further out on the arousal scale. Whereas if they're working on a complex task, like driving uh, and trying to text at the same time, here your arousal level 
uh, starts to interfere with that task. You can see the difference here between a simple and, and uh, complex task, which is not that surprising. But it's interesting that the arousal levels that interfere with the performance are lower, so they start to have that negative impact on performance earlier for a complex task versus a simple task. So these, this is a finding that's been replicated in a lot of different studies as well. Now we said that we would look at uh, natural and technological disasters as a stressor, and this is the last category of constraints I want to talk about. And I'll show you some examples of natural and technological disasters, and we want to talk about what's the psychological differences between those two categories of events. And there's been a fair amount of research on that. Here you've got the Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004, and uh, here you've got the more recent uh, earthquake in Japan and the tsunami there. And as we said earlier in the course, nowadays these events are brought to us in real time or very shortly after they happen. So we have all the vivid details of the suffering and the horror of the environment doing something that's extremely dramatic, atypical, and harmful to the people in its way. Now, in the article assigned uh, by Baum, Fleming, and Davidson, they, they talk about natural disasters having a, a, a low point, a natural low point, where the worst is over. And you know, kind of, after an earthquake, uh, pretty much the worst shaking is over, although there are aftershocks, so it's a little bit unpredictable. But when a tornado comes through, you, you definitely know when the worst has happened and when the worst is over. Technological disasters don't have that clear low point. So if you're living near San Onofre and there's an accident there involving some leakage of radioactive gases, it's unclear to you whether that's a harm to your health in the long run or not, because you can't see those gases you're stuck with that uncertainty, and that's a good example of a chronic stressor that can have these indirect, long-term effects on our physiology and health. So they claim that in this article, natural disasters are more likely to have a low point than technological disasters. And you can see this in the uh, tsunami that hit Banda Aceh in Indonesia in 2004, where the low point, obviously, was after all that water basically erased this part of the community. I mean, it was utter devastation. And if you go on the internet now and you look at what's happening in Banda Aceh, they've rebuilt all that, it's, it's recovered. But this was the low point, clearly, uh, when that happened. So you've got natural disasters and you've got technological disasters, and this one was not as bad as what happened at Fukushima, nor at Chernobyl, but Nonetheless, it created a lot of uncertainty because it was clear that some radioactive gases escaped into the atmosphere, and people were pretty worried about that. And at Three Mile Island, uh, Baum, Andrew Baum and his colleagues, looked at blood pressure levels among residents of Three Mile Island, Pennsylvania. One year before the accident, they went to doctor's records and they looked at what people's blood pressures were before the uh, accident at TMI and then one year after the accident. And these are people living in a control community with a, an energy reactor that wasn't nuclear, didn't have a problem. These are people at 3MI, uh, Three Mile Island, that expressed little stress over the event. They didn't feel they were particularly harmed or vulnerable to that radioactive gas. These were people who were worrying about it, worrying about their exposure, uncertain, uh, rather than sort of transformationally coping and saying, it's okay, I probably wasn't exposed, they were sort of focusing on and sensitizing to the possible danger. Their blood pressure one year after the accident was much higher. So this is another example of what Lazarus means by appraisal of the stressor. Two people or two sets of people living in the same community undergoing that technological disaster, but the stress level is much higher here because of the appraisal of this blue group uh, that things were worse for them. Okay, so there are a lot of different kinds of technological, uh, natural disasters and technological disasters. This is at Love Canal. How many of you have been to Love Canal in Buffalo, New York? Anybody ever been up there? This is a community that was virtually closed, closed down in a matter of a few months because the New York State Department of Health was getting reports of all these uh, elevated cancer rates, infant mortality. They went out to study the soil here and they found that it was highly contaminated 
from an earlier company, Hooker Chemical Company, doing a dump of toxic chemicals in this area here, which became a school ground. And the effects of that chemical dump weren't known until this community grew up over it. And then you started having all these health problems. So that was a technological disaster that basically closed down that whole community. When I visited there, uh, basically these homes were boarded up and, and people had to get out of their homes, lose their home value because of that disaster. Now, let me just close with uh, two last PowerPoints. And you can look at these uh, in more detail when you download the slides. These are, this is basically from the Baum et al. article showing how natural and technological disasters are different in terms of things like their low point or their perceptions of people's perceptions of control over them or persistence of effects after they occur. So what I would like you to be aware of is generally how do they distinguish between natural and technological disasters in terms of the low point or lack of low point, the visible extensive damage versus the invisible damage that people worry about in technological disasters, community support in helping versus blame, acute health impacts versus chronic. Now, one last point before we break, and that is that their distinction obviously is overgeneralized. There are aspects of Katrina, you know, the, the, the hurricane in New Orleans that involved both natural and technological features, right? So the hurricane came along and devastated that community, but the fact that the levees were not constructed properly was a human-caused issue, right? That was a technological problem. So a lot of times our disasters are not so cleanly uh, identifiable as just natural and technological, but they have components of both. So that's important to be aware. But, but generally, some of these points about the low point uh, or about the visible and invisible damage are compelling. You know, they, they do sort of differentiate those stressors in some very important ways. So one more question. Is it ja uh, Rochelle. Rochelle? Well, if it's a terrorist event, you've got a human-caused intentional disaster. So it's a special category of technological, but, the, but it, it can hurt our natural system, right? They can pollute rivers or they can cause some problem to uh, a natural system. So you have these strange combinations of natural and technological. So, yeah. All right, have a good weekend. We'll see you on Tuesday.